Chapter 13. The summer evening had begun to fold the world in its mysterious embrace. Far away in the west the sun was setting and the last glow of all too fleeting day lingered lovingly on sea and strand, on the proud promontory of dear old Hoth guarding as ever the waters of the bay, on the weed-grown rocks along Sandy Mount shore and, last but not least, on the quiet church whence there streamed forth at times upon the stillness the voice of prayer to her who is in her pure radiance a beacon ever to the storm-tossed heart of man, Mary, star of the sea. The three girl friends were seated on the rocks, enjoying the evening scene in the air which was fresh but not too chilly. Many a time and oft were they wont to come there to that favorite nook to have a cozy chat beside the sparkling waves and discuss matters feminine, Sissy Caffrey and Eddie Boardman with the baby in the pushcar and Tommy and Jackie Caffrey, two little curly-headed boys, dressed in sailor suits with caps to match and the name HMS Belle Isle printed on both. For Tommy and Jackie Caffrey were twins, scarce four years old and very noisy and spoiled twins sometimes but for all that darling little fellows with bright merry faces and endearing ways about them. They were dabbling in the sand with their spades and buckets, building castles as children do, or playing with their big colored ball, happy as the day was long. And Eddie Boardman was rocking the chubby baby to and fro in the pushcar while that young gentleman fairly chuckled with delight. He was but eleven months and nine days old and, though still a tiny toddler, was just beginning to lisp his first babyish words. Sissy Caffrey bent over to him to tease his fat little plucks and the dainty dimple in his chin. Now, baby, Sissy Caffrey said. Say out big, big. I want a drink of water. And baby prattled after her, a jink a jink a jawbo. Sissy Caffrey cuddled the wee chap for she was awfully fond of children, so patient with little sufferers and Tommy Caffrey could never be got to take his castor oil unless it was Sissy Caffrey that held his nose and promised him the scatty heel of the loaf or brown bread with golden syrup on. What a persuasive power that girl had. But to be sure baby Boardman was as good as gold, a perfect little dote in his new fancy bib. None of your spoilt beauties, Flora McFlimsy sort, was Sissy Caffrey. A truer-hearted lass never drew the breath of life, always with a laugh in her gypsy-like eyes and a frolicsome word on her cherry-ripe red lips, a girl lovable in the extreme. And Eddie Boardman laughed too at the quaint language of little brother. But just then there was a slight altercation between Master Tommy and Master Jackie. Boys will be boys and our two twins were no exception to this golden rule. The apple of discord was a certain castle of sand which Master Jackie had built and Master Tommy would have it right go wrong that it was to be architecturally improved by a front door like the Martello Tower had. But if Master Tommy was headstrong Master Jackie was self-willed too and, true to the maxim that every little Irishman's house is his castle, he fell upon his hated rival and to such purpose that the would-be assailant came to grief and, alas to relate, the coveted castle too. Needless to say the cries of discomfited Master Tommy drew the attention of the girl friends. Come here. Tommy, his sister called imperatively. At once. And you, Jackie, for shame to throw poor Tommy in the dirty sand. Wait till I catch you for that. His eyes misty with unshed tears Master Tommy came at her call for their big sister's word was law with the twins. And in a sad plight he was too after his misadventure. His little man o war top and unmentionables were full of sand but Sissy was a past mistress in the art of smoothing over life's tiny troubles and very quickly not one speck of sand was to be seen on a smart little suit. Still the blue eyes were glistening with hot tears that would well up so she kissed away the hurtness and shook her hand at Master Jackie the culprit and said if she was near him she wouldn't be far from him, her eyes dancing in admonition. Nasty bold Jackie. She cried. She put an arm round the little mariner and coaxed winningly, what's your name? Butter and cream? Tell us who is your sweetheart, spoke Eddie Boardman. Is Sissy your sweetheart? Now, tearful Tommy said. Is Eddie Boardman your sweetheart? Sissy queried. Now, Tommy said. I know, Eddie Boardman said none too amiably with an arch glance from her short-sighted eyes. I know who is Tommy's sweetheart. Jerdy is Tommy's sweetheart. Now, Tommy said on the verge of tears. Sissy's quick mother wit guessed what was amiss and she whispered to Eddie Boardman to take him there behind the pushcar where the gentleman couldn't see and to mind he didn't wet his new tan shoes. But who was Jerdy? Jerdy McDowell who was seated near her companions, lost in thought gazing far away into the distance was, in very truth, as fair a specimen of winsome Irish girlhood as one could wish to see. She was pronounced beautiful by all who knew her though, as folks often said, she was more a giltrap than a McDowell. Her figure was slight and graceful, inclining even to fragility but those iron jelloids she had been taking of late had done her a world of good much better than the widow Welch's female pills and she was much better of those discharges she used to get in that tired feeling. The waxen pallor of her face was almost spiritual in its ivory-like purity though her rosebud mouth was a genuine Cupid's bow, Greekly perfect. 
her hands were of finely veined alabaster with tapering fingers and as white as lemon juice and queen of ointments could make them though it was not true that she used to wear kid gloves in bed or take a milk footbath either. Bertha Supple told that once to Eddie Boardman, a deliberate lie, when she was black out at daggers drawn with dirty, the girl chums had of course their little tiffs from time to time like the rest of mortals, and she told her not to let on whatever she did that it was her that told her or she'd never speak to her again. No. Honor where honor is due. There was an innate refinement, a languid queenly hauteur about Jerdy which was unmistakably evidenced in her delicate hands and high arched in step. Had kind fate but willed her to be born a gentlewoman of high degree in her own right and had she only received the benefit of a good education Jerdy McDowell might easily have held her own beside any lady in the land and have seen herself exquisitely gowned with jewels on her brow and patrician suitors at her feet vying with one another to pay their devoirs to her. Mayhap it was this, the love that might have been, that lent to her softly featured face at whiles a look, tense with suppressed meaning, that imparted a strange yearning tendency to the beautiful eyes, a charm few could resist. Why have women such eyes of witchery? Jerdy's were of the bluest Irish blue, set off by lustrous lashes and dark expressive brows. Time was when those brows were not so silkily seductive. It was Madame Vera Verity, directress of the woman beautiful page of the Princess Novelette, who had first advised her to try eyebrowing which gave that haunting expression to the eyes, so becoming in leaders of fashion, and she had never regretted it. Then there was blushing scientifically cured and how to be tall increase your height and you have a beautiful face but your nose? That would suit Mrs. Dignam because she had a button one. But Jerdy's crowning glory was her wealth of wonderful hair. It was dark brown with a natural wave in it. She had cut it that very morning on account of the new moon and it nestled about her pretty head in a profusion of luxuriant clusters and paired her nails too, Thursday for wealth. And just now at Edie's words as a telltale flush, delicate as the faintest rose bloom, crept into her cheeks she looked so lovely in her sweet girlish shyness that of a surety God's fair land of Ireland did not hold her equal. For an instant she was silent with rather sad downcast eyes. She was about to retort but something checked the words on her tongue. Inclination prompted her to speak out, dignity told her to be silent. The pretty lips pouted a while but then she glanced up and broke out into a joyous little laugh which had in it all the freshness of a young May morning. She knew right well, no one better, what made Squinny Eddie say that because of him cooling in his attentions when it was simply a lover's quarrel. As per usual somebody's nose was out of joint about the boy that had the bicycle off the London Bridge Road always riding up and down in front of her window. Only now his father kept him in in the evening studying hard to get an exhibition in the intermediate that was on and he was going to go to Trinity College to study for a doctor when he left the high school like his brother W. E. Wiley who was racing in the bicycle races in Trinity College University. Little wrecked he perhaps for what she felt, that dull aching void in her heart sometimes, piercing to the core. Yet he was young and perchance he might learn to love her in time. They were Protestants in his family and of course Jerdy knew who came first and after him the Blessed Virgin and then St. Joseph. But he was undeniably handsome with an exquisite nose and he was what he looked, every inch a gentleman, the shape of his head too at the back without his cap on that she would know anywhere something off the common and the way he turned the bicycle at the lamp with his hands off the bars and also the nice perfume of those good cigarettes and besides they were both of a size too he and she and that was why Eddie Boardman thought she was so frightfully clever because he didn't go and ride up and down in front of her bit of a garden. Jerdy was dressed simply but with the instinctive taste of a votary of dame fashion for she felt that there was just a mite that he might be out. A neat blouse of electric blue self-tinted by Dolly Dyes, because it was expected in the ladies' pictorial that electric blue would be worn, with a smart V opening down to the division and kerchief pocket, in which she always kept a piece of cotton wool scented with her favorite perfume because the handkerchief spoiled the sit, and a navy three-quarter skirt cut to the stride showed off her slim graceful figure to perfection. She wore a coquettish little love of a hat of wide-leaved nigger straw contrast trimmed with an underbrim of egg blue chenille and at the side a butterfly bow of silk to tone. All Tuesday week afternoon she was hunting to match that chenille but at last she found what she wanted at Cleary's summer sales, the variet, slightly shopsoiled but you would never notice, seven fingers two and a penny. She did it up all by herself and what joy was hers when she tried it on then, smiling at the lovely reflection which the mirror gave back to her. And when she put it on the water jug to keep the shape she knew that that would take the shine out of some people she knew. Her shoes were the newest thing in footwear, Eddie Boardman prided herself that she was very petite but she never had a foot like Jerdy McDowell, a five, and never would ash, oak or elm, with patent toe caps and just one smart buckle over her high arched instep. Her well-turned ankle displayed its perfect proportions beneath her skirt and just the proper amount and no more of her shapely limbs encased in fine-spun hose with high-spliced heels and wide garter tops. As for undies they were Jerdy's chief care and who that knows the fluttering hopes and fears of sweet seventeen, though Jerdy would never see seventeen again can find it in his heart to blame her? 
she had four dinky sets with awfully pretty stitchery, three garments and nighties extra, and each set slotted with different colored ribbons, rose pink, pale blue, mauve and pea green, and she aired them herself and blued them when they came home from the wash and ironed them and she had a brick bat to keep the iron on because she wouldn't trust those washerwomen as far as she'd see them scorching the things. She was wearing the blue for luck, hoping against hope, her own color and lucky too for a bride to have a bit of blue somewhere on her because the green she wore that day week brought grief because his father brought him in to study for the intermediate exhibition and because she thought perhaps he might be out because when she was dressing that morning she nearly slipped up the old pair on her inside out and that was for luck and lovers meeting if you put those things on inside out or if they got untied that he was thinking about you so long as it wasn't of a Friday. And yet and yet. That strained look on her face. A gnawing sorrow is there all the time. Her very soul is in her eyes and she would give worlds to be in the privacy of her own familiar chamber where, giving way to tears, she could have a good cry and relieve her pent-up feelings though not too much because she knew how to cry nicely before the mirror. You are lovely, dirty, it said. The poly light of evening falls upon a face infinitely sad and wistful. Dirty McDowell yearns in vain. Yes, she had known from the very first that her daydream of a marriage has been arranged and the wedding bells ringing for Mrs. Reggie Wiley T. C. D because the one who married the elder brother would be Mrs. Wiley, and in the fashionable intelligence Mrs. Gertrude Wiley was wearing a sumptuous confection of grey trimmed with expensive blue fox was not to be. He was too young to understand. He would not believe in love, a woman's birthright. The night of the party long ago in stores, he was still in short trousers, when they were alone and he stole an arm round her waist she went white to the very lips. He called her little one in a strangely husky voice and snatched a half kiss, the first, but it was only the end of her nose and then he hastened from the room with a remark about refreshments. Impetuous fellow. Strength of character had never been Reggie Wiley's strong point and he who would woo and win Jerdy McDowell must be a man among men. But waiting, always waiting to be asked and it was leap year two and would soon be over. No prince charming is her beau ideal to lay a rare and wondrous love at her feet but rather a manly man with a strong quiet face who had not found his ideal perhaps his hair slightly flecked with grey, and who would understand, take her in his sheltering arms, strain her to him in all the strength of his deep passionate nature and comfort her with a long long kiss. It would be like heaven. For such a one she yearns this balmy summer eve. With all the heart of her she longs to be his only, his affianced bride for riches for poor, in sickness in health, till death us two part, from this to this day forward. And while Eddie Boardman was with little Tommy behind the pushcar she was just thinking would the day ever come when she could call herself his little wife-to-be. Then they could talk about her till they went blue in the face, Bertha Supple too, and Eddie, little Spitfire, because she would be twenty-two in November. She would care for him with creature comforts too for Jerdy was womanly wise and knew that a mere man liked that feeling of hominess. Her griddle cakes done to a golden brown hue and Queen Anne's pudding of delightful creaminess had won golden opinions from all because she had a lucky hand also for lighting a fire dredge in the fine self-raising flour and always stir in the same direction, then cream the milk and sugar and whisk well the white of eggs though she didn't like the eating part when there were any people that made her shy and often she wondered why you couldn't eat something poetical like violets or roses and they would have a beautifully appointed drawing room with pictures and engravings and the photograph of Grandpapa Giltrap's lovely dog Gario and that almost talked it was so human and chintz covers for the chairs and that silver toast rack in Cleary's summer jumble sales like they have in rich houses. He would be tall with broad shoulders, she had always admired tall men for a husband, with glistening white teeth under his carefully trimmed sweeping mustache and they would go on the continent for their honeymoon, three wonderful weeks, and then, when they settled down in a nice snug and cozy little homely house, every morning they would both have brekkie, simple but perfectly served, for their own two selves and before he went out to business he would give his dear little wifey a good hearty hug and gaze for a moment deep down into her eyes. Eddie Boardman asked Tommy Caffrey was he done and he said yes so then she buttoned up his little knickerbockers for him and told him to run off and play with Jackie and to be good now and not to fight. But Tommy said he wanted the ball and Eddie told him no that baby was playing with the ball and if he took it there'd be wigs on the green but Tommy said it was his ball and he wanted his ball and he pranced on the ground, if you please. The temper of him. Oh, he was a man already was little Tommy Caffrey since he was out of pennies. Eddie told him no, no one to be off now with him and she told Sissy Caffrey not to give in to him. You're not my sister, naughty Tommy said. It's my ball. But Sissy Caffrey told baby Boardman to look up, look up high at her finger and she snatched the ball quickly and threw it along the sand and Tommy after it in full career, having won the day. Anything for a quiet life, laughed Sis. And she tickled Tiny Tot's two cheeks to make him forget and played here's the Lord Mayor, here's his two horses, here's his gingerbread carriage and here he walks in, chin chopper, chin chopper, chin chopper chin. 
but Eddie got as cross as two sticks about him getting his own way like that from everyone always petting him. I'd like to give him something, she said, so I would, where I won't say. On the beauty tome, laughed Sissy merrily. Jerdy McDowell bent down her head and crimsoned at the idea of Sissy saying an unladylike thing like that out loud she'd be ashamed of her life to say, flushing a deep rosy red, and Eddie Boardman said she was sure the gentleman opposite heard what she said. But not a pin cared sis. Let him. She said with a pert toss of her head and a piquant tilt of her nose. Give it to him too on the same place as quick as I'd look at him. Madcap sis with her gullywog curls. You had to laugh at her sometimes. For instance when she asked you would you have some more Chinese tea and jazzberry ram and when she drew the jugs too and the men's faces on her nails with red ink make you split your sides or when she wanted to go where you know she said she wanted to run and pay a visit to the Miss White. That was just like sissy comes. Oh, and will you ever forget her the evening she dressed up in her father's suit and hat and the burned cork mustache and walked down Trittonville Road, smoking a cigarette. There was none to come up to her for fun. But she was sincerity itself, one of the bravest and truest hearts heaven ever made not one of your two-faced things, too sweet to be wholesome. And then there came out upon the air the sound of voices and the pealing anthem of the organ. It was the men's temperance retreat conducted by the missioner, the Reverend John Hughes S. J., Rosary, Sermon and Benediction of the Most Blessed Sacrament. They were there gathered together without distinction of social class, and a most edifying spectacle it was to see, in that simple fane beside the waves, after the storms of this weary world, kneeling before the feet of the Immaculate, reciting the litany of Our Lady of Loreto, beseeching her to intercede for them, the old familiar words, Holy Mary, Holy Virgin of Virgins. How sad to poor Jerdy's ears. Had her father only avoided the clutches of the demon drink, by taking the pledge or those powders the drink habit cured in Pearson's Weekly, she might now be rolling in her carriage, second to none. Over and over had she told herself that as she mused by the dying embers in a brown study without the lamp because she hated two lights or oftentimes gazing out of the window dreamily by the hour at the rain falling on the rusty bucket, thinking. But that vile decoction which has ruined so many hearths and homes had cast its shadow over her childhood days. Nay, she had even witnessed in the home circle deeds of violence caused by intemperance and had seen her own father, a prey to the fumes of intoxication forget himself completely for if there was one thing of all things that Jerdy knew it was that the man who lifts his hand to a woman save in the way of kindness, deserves to be branded as the lowest of the low. And still the voices sang in supplication to the virgin most powerful, virgin most merciful. And Jerdy, wrapped in thought, scarce saw or heard her companions or the twins at their boyish gambles or the gentleman off Sandy Mount Green that Sissy Caffrey called the man that was so like himself passing along the strand taking a short walk. You never saw him any way screwed but still and for all that she would not like him for a father because he was too old or something or on account of his face, it was a palpable case of Dr. Fell, or his carbuncly nose with the pimples on it and his sandy mustache a bit white under his nose. Poor father. With all his faults she loved him still when he sang Tell Me, Mary, How to Woo Thee or My Love and Cottage Near Rochelle and they had stewed cockles and lettuce with Lazenby's salad dressing for supper and when he sang The Moon Hath Raised with Mr. Dignam that died suddenly and was buried, God have mercy on him from a stroke. Her mother's birthday that was and Charlie was home on his holidays and Tom and Mr. Dignam and Mrs. and Patsy and Freddie Dignam and they were to have had a group taken. No one would have thought the end was so near. Now he was laid to rest. And her mother said to him to let that be a warning to him for the rest of his days and he couldn't even go to the funeral on account of the gout and she had to go into town to bring him the letters and samples from his office about Catesby's cork lino, artistic, standard designs, fit for a palace, gives tip-top wear and always bright and cheery in the home. A sterling good daughter was Jerdy just like a second mother in the house, a ministering angel too with a little heart worth its weight in gold. And when her mother had those raging splitting headaches who was it rubbed the menthol cone on her forehead but Jerdy though she didn't like her mother's taking pinches of snuff and that was the only single thing they ever had words about, taking snuff. Everyone thought the world of her for her gentle ways. It was Jerdy who turned off the gas at the main every night and it was Jerdy who tacked up on the wall of that place where she never forgot every fortnight the chlorate of lime Mr. Tunney the grocer's Christmas almanac, the picture of halcyon days where a young gentleman in the costume they used to wear then with a three-cornered hat was offering a bunch of flowers to his lady love with old-time chivalry through her lattice window. You could see there was a story behind it. The colors were done something lovely. She was in a soft clinging white in a studied attitude and the gentleman was in chocolate and he looked a thorough aristocrat. She often looked at them dreamily when she went there for a certain purpose and felt her own arms that were white and soft just like hers with the sleeves back and thought about those times because she had found out in Walker's pronouncing dictionary that belonged to Grandpapa Giltrap about the halcyon days what they meant. 
The twins were now playing in the most approved brotherly fashion till at last Master Jackie who was really as bold as brass there was no getting behind that deliberately kicked the ball as hard as ever he could down towards the seaweedy rocks. Needless to say poor Tommy was not slow to voice his dismay but luckily the gentleman in black who was sitting there by himself came gallantly to the rescue and intercepted the ball. Our two champions claimed their plaything with lusty cries and to avoid trouble Sissy Caffrey called to the gentleman to throw it to her please. The gentleman aimed the ball once or twice and then threw it up the strand towards Sissy Caffrey but it rolled down the slope and stopped right under Jerdy's skirt near the little pool by the rock. The twins clamored again for it and Sissy told her to kick it away and let them fight for it so Jerdy drew back her foot but she wished their stupid ball hadn't come rolling down to her and she gave a kick but she missed and Eddie and Sissy laughed. If you fail try again, Eddie Boardman said. Jerdy smiled assent and bit her lip. A delicate pink crept into her pretty cheek but she was determined to let them see so she just lifted her skirt a little but just enough and took good aim and gave the ball a jolly good kick and it went ever so far and the two twins after it down towards the shingle. Pure jealousy of course it was nothing else to draw attention on account of the gentleman opposite looking. She felt the warm flush, a danger signal always with Jerdy McDowell, surging and flaming into her cheeks. Till then they had only exchanged glances of the most casual but now under the brim of her new hat she ventured a look at him and the face that met her gaze there in the twilight, wan and strangely drawn, seemed to her the saddest she had ever seen. Through the open window of the church the fragrant incense was wafted and with it the fragrant names of her who was conceived without stain of original sin, spiritual vessel, pray for us, honorable vessel, pray for us, vessel of singular devotion, pray for us, mystical rose and careworn hearts were there and toilers for their daily bread and many who had erred and wandered, their eyes wet with contrition but for all that bright with hope for the Reverend Father Father Hughes had told them what the great Saint Bernard said in his famous prayer of Mary, the most pious virgin's intercessory power that it was not recorded in any age that those who implored her powerful protection were ever abandoned by her. The twins were now playing again right merrily for the troubles of childhood are but as fleeting summer showers. Sissy Caffrey played with baby Boardman till he crowed with glee, clapping baby hands in air. Peep she cried behind the hood of the pushcar and Eddie asked where was Sissy gone and then Sissy popped up her head and cried ah. And, my word, didn't the little chap enjoy that. And then she told him to say papa. Say papa, baby. Say pa 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 pa. And baby did his level best to say it for he was very intelligent for eleven months everyone said and big for his age and the picture of health, a perfect little bunch of love, and he would certainly turn out to be something great, they said. Aja ja ja aja. Sissy wiped his little mouth with a dribbling bib and wanted him to sit up properly and say pa 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 but when she undid the strap she cried out, holy Saint Dennis, that he was passing wet and to double the half blanket the other way under him. Of course his infant majesty was most obstreperous at such toilet formalities and he let everyone know it, have a ba ba ba. And two great big lovely big tears coursing down his cheeks. It was all no use soothering him with no, no no, baby, no and telling him about the Gigi and where was the puff puff but sis, always ready witted, gave him in his mouth the teat of the sucking bottle and the young heathen was quickly appeased. Jerdy wished to goodness they would take their squalling baby home out of that and not get on her nerves, no hour to be out, and the little brats of twins. She gazed out towards the distant sea. It was like the paintings that man used to do on the pavement with all the colored chalks and such a pity too leaving them there to be all blotted out, the evening and the clouds coming out and the bailey light on hoth and to hear the music like that and the perfume of those incense they burned in the church like a kind of waft. And while she gazed her heart went pit-a-pat. Yes, it was her he was looking at, and there was meaning in his look. His eyes burned into her as though they would search her through and through, read her very soul. Wonderful eyes they were, superbly expressive, but could you trust them? People were so queer. She could see at once by his dark eyes and his pale intellectual face that he was a foreigner, the image of the photo she had of Martin Harvey, the matinee idol, only for the mustache which she preferred because she wasn't stage-struck like Winnie Rippingham that wanted they two to always dress the same on account of a play but she could not see whether he had an aquiline nose or a slightly retroussé from where he was sitting. He was in deep mourning, she could see that, and the story of a haunting sorrow was written on his face. She would have given worlds to know what it was. He was looking up so intently, so still, and he saw her kick the ball and perhaps he could see the bright steel buckles of her shoes if she swung them like that thoughtfully with the toes down. She was glad that something told her to put on the transparent stockings thinking Reggie Wiley might be out, but that was far away. Here was that of which she had so often dreamed. It was he who mattered and there was joy on her face because she wanted him because she felt instinctively that he was like no one else. The very heart of the girl woman went out to him, her dream husband, because she knew on the instant it was him. If he had suffered, more sinned against than sinning, or even, even, 
if he had been himself a sinner, a wicked man, she cared not. Even if he was a Protestant or Methodist she could convert him easily if he truly loved her. There were wounds that wanted healing with heart bomb. She was a womanly woman not like other flighty girls unfeminine he had known, those cyclists showing off what they hadn't got and she just yearned to know all, to forgive all if she could make him fall in love with her, make him forget the memory of the past. Then mayhap he would embrace her gently, like a real man, crushing her soft body to him, and love her, his ownest girly, for herself alone. Refuge of sinners. Comfortress of the afflicted. Or a pro nobis. Well has it been said that whosoever prays to her with faith and constancy can never be lost or cast away, and fitly is she too a haven of refuge for the afflicted because of the seven dolors which transpierced her own heart. Jerdy could picture the whole scene in the church, the stained glass windows lighted up, the candles, the flowers and the blue banners of the Blessed Virgin Sodality and Father Conroy was helping Canon O'Hanlon at the altar, carrying things in and out with his eyes cast down. He looked almost a saint and his confession box was so quiet and clean and dark and his hands were just like white wax and if ever she became a Dominican nun in their white habit perhaps he might come to the convent for the novena of Saint Dominic. He told her that time when she told him about that in confession, crimsoning up to the roots of her hair for fear he could see, not to be troubled because that was only the voice of nature and we were all subject to nature's laws, he said, in this life and that that was no sin because that came from the nature of woman instituted by God, he said and that our blessed lady herself said to the archangel Gabriel be it done unto me according to thy word. He was so kind and holy and often and often she thought and thought could she work a ruche tea cozy with embroidered floral design for him as a present or a clock but they had a clock she noticed on the mantelpiece white and gold with a canary bird that came out of a little house to tell the time the day she went there about the flowers for the forty hours adoration because it was hard to know what sort of a present to give or perhaps an album of illuminated views of Dublin or some place. The exasperating little brats of twins began to quarrel again and Jackie threw the ball out towards the sea and they both ran after it. Little monkeys common as ditchwater. Someone ought to take them and give them a good hiding for themselves to keep them in their places, the both of them. And Sissy and Eddie shouted after them to come back because they were afraid the tide might come in on them and be drowned. Jackie. Tommy. Not they. What a great notion they had. So Sissy said it was the very last time she'd ever bring them out. She jumped up and called them and she ran down the slope past him, tossing her hair behind her which had a good enough color if there had been more of it but with all the thing Mary she was always rubbing into it she couldn't get it to grow long because it wasn't natural so she could just go and throw her hat at it. She ran with long gandery strides it was a wonder she didn't rip up her skirt at the side that was too tight on her because there was a lot of the tomboy about Sissy Caffrey and she was a forward piece whenever she thought she had a good opportunity to show off and just because she was a good runner she ran like that so that he could see all the end of her petticoat running and her skinny shanks up as far as possible. It would have served her just right if she had tripped up over something accidentally on purpose with her high crooked French heels on her to make her look tall and got a fine tumble. Tableau. That would have been a very charming expose for a gentleman like that to witness. Queen of angels, queen of patriarchs, queen of prophets, of all saints, they prayed, queen of the most holy rosary and then Father Conroy handed the thurible to Canon O'Hanlon and he put in the incense and sensed the blessed sacrament and Sissy Caffrey caught the two twins and she was itching to give them a ringing good clip on the ear but she didn't because she thought he might be watching but she never made a bigger mistake in all her life because Jerdy could see without looking that he never took his eyes off of her and then Canon O'Hanlon handed the thurible back to Father Conroy and knelt down looking up at the blessed sacrament and the choir began to sing the tantum ergo and she just swung her foot in and out in time as the music rose and fell to the tantum ergo sacramentum. 3 and 11 she paid for those stockings in Sparrows of George's Street on the Tuesday, no the Monday before Easter and there wasn't a brack on them and that was what he was looking at, transparent, and not at her insignificant ones that had neither shape nor form, the cheek of her, because he had eyes in his head to see the difference for himself. Sissy came up along the strand with the two twins and their ball with her hat anyhow on her to one side after her run and she did look a streel tugging the two kids along with the flimsy blouse she bought only a fortnight before like a rag on her back and a bit of her petticoat hanging like a caricature. Jerdy just took off her hat for a moment to settle her hair in a prettier, a daintier head of nut-brown tresses was never seen on a girl's shoulders a radiant little vision, in sooth, almost maddening in its sweetness. You would have to travel many a long mile before you found a head of hair the like of that. She could almost see the swift answering flash of admiration in his eyes that set her tingling in every nerve. She put on her hat so that she could see from underneath the brim and swung her buckled shoe faster for her breath caught as she caught the expression in his eyes. He was eyeing her as a snake eyes its prey. Her woman's instinct told her that she had raised the devil in him and at the thought a burning scarlet swept from throat to brow till the lovely color of her face became a glorious rose. Eddie Boardman was noticing it too because she was squinting at Jerdy, half smiling, 
with her specs like an old maid, pretending to nurse the baby. Irritable little gnat she was and always would be and that was why no one could get on with her poking her nose into what was no concern of hers. And she said to Jerdy, a penny for your thoughts. What? replied Jerdy with a smile reinforced by the whitest of teeth. I was only wondering was it late? Because she wished to goodness they'd take the snotty-nosed twins and their babby home to the mischief out of that so that was why she just gave a gentle hint about its being late. And when Sissy came up Eddie asked her the time and Miss Sissy, as glib as you like, said it was half past kissing time, time to kiss again. But Eddie wanted to know because they were told to be in early. Wait, said Sissy, I'll run ask my uncle Peter over there what's the time by his conundrum. So over she went and when he saw her coming she could see him take his hand out of his pocket, getting nervous, and beginning to play with his watch chain, looking up at the church. Passionate nature though he was jerty could see that he had enormous control over himself. One moment he had been there, fascinated by a loveliness that made him gaze, and the next moment it was the quiet grey-faced gentleman, self-control expressed in every line of his distinguished-looking figure. Sissy said to excuse her would he mind please telling her what was the right time and Jerdy could see him taking out his watch, listening to it and looking up and clearing his throat and he said he was very sorry his watch was stopped but he thought it must be after 8 because the sun was set. His voice had a cultured ring in it and though he spoke in measured accents there was a suspicion of a quiver in the mellow tones. Sissy said, thanks and came back with her tongue out and said uncle said his waterworks were out of order. Then they sang the second verse of the Tantum Ergo and Canon O'Hanlon got up again and sensed the blessed sacrament and knelt down and he told Father Conroy that one of the candles was just going to set fire to the flowers and Father Conroy got up and settled it all right and she could see the gentleman winding his watch and listening to the works and she swung her leg more in and out in time. It was getting darker but he could see and he was looking all the time that he was winding the watch or whatever he was doing to it and then he put it back and put his hands back into his pockets. She felt a kind of a sensation rushing all over her and she knew by the feel of her scalp and that irritation against her stays that that thing must be coming on because the last time too was when she clipped her hair on account of the moon. His dark eyes fixed themselves on her again drinking in her every contour, literally worshipping at her shrine. If ever there was undisguised admiration in a man's passionate gaze it was there plain to be seen on that man's face. It is for you, Gertrude McDowell, and you know it. Eddie began to get ready to go and it was high time for her and Jerdy noticed that that little hint she gave it had the desired effect because it was a long way along the strand to where there was the place to push up the pushcar and Sissy took off the twins caps and tidied their hair to make herself attractive of course and Canon O'Hanlon stood up with his coat poking up at his neck and Father Conroy handed him the card to read off and he read out Ponum de Coelho Priestitis de Ice and Eddie and Sissy were talking about the time all the time and asking her but Jerdy could pay them back in their own coin and she just answered with scathing politeness when Eddie asked her was she heartbroken about her best boy throwing her over. Jerdy winced sharply. A brief cold blaze shone from her eyes that spoke volumes of scorn immeasurable. It hurt oh yes, it cut deep because Eddie had her own quiet way of saying things like that she knew would wound like the confounded little cat she was. Jerdy's lips parted swiftly to frame the word but she fought back the sob that rose to her throat, so slim, so flawless, so beautifully molded it seemed one an artist might have dreamed of. She had loved him better than he knew. Light-hearted deceiver and fickle like all his sex he would never understand what he had meant to her and for an instant there was in the blue eyes a quick stinging of tears. Their eyes were probing her mercilessly but with a brave effort she sparkled back in sympathy as she glanced at her new conquest for them to see. Oh, responded Jerdy, quick as lightning, laughing, and the proud head flashed up. I can throw my cap at who I like because it's leap year. Her words rang out crystal clear, more musical than the cooing of the ringdove, but they cut the silence icily. There was that in her young voice that told that she was not a one to be lightly trifled with. As for Mr. Reggie with his swank and his bit of money she could just chuck him aside as if he was so much filth and never again would she cast as much as a second thought on him and tear his silly postcard into a dozen pieces. And if ever after he dared to presume she could give him one look of measured scorn that would make him shrivel up on the spot. Miss puny little Edie's countenance fell to no slight extent and Jerdy could see by her looking as black as thunder that she was simply in a towering rage though she hid it, the little canat because that shaft had struck home for her petty jealousy and they both knew that she was something aloof, apart, in another sphere, that she was not of them and never would be and there was somebody else too that knew it and saw it so they could put that in their pipe and smoke it. Eddie straightened up baby boardman to get ready to go and Sissy tucked in the ball and the spades and buckets and it was high time too because the sandman was on his way for Master Boardman Jr. And Sissy told him too that Billy Winks was coming and that baby was to go dee-daw and baby looked just too ducky, laughing up out of his gleeful eyes, and Sissy poked him like that out of fun and his wee fat tummy and baby, without as much as by your leave, sent up his compliments to all and sundry on to his brand new dribbling bib. Oh my! Puddeny pie! 
protested Sis. He is his bib destroyed. The slight contretom claimed her attention but in two twos she set that little matter to rights. Jerdy stifled a smothered exclamation and gave a nervous cough and Eddie asked what and she was just going to tell her to catch it while it was flying but she was ever ladylike in her deportment so she simply passed it off with consummate tact by saying that that was the benediction because just then the bell rang out from the steeple over the quiet seashore because Canon O'Hanlon was up on the altar with the veil that Father Conroy put round his shoulders giving the benediction with the blessed sacrament in his hands. How moving the scene there in the gathering twilight, the last glimpse of Aaron, the touching chime of those evening bells and at the same time a bat flew forth from the ivied belfry through the dusk, hither, thither, with a tiny lost cry. And she could see far away the lights of the lighthouses so picturesque she would have loved to do with a box of paints because it was easier than to make a man and soon the lamplighter would be going his rounds past the Presbyterian church grounds and along by shady Trittonville Avenue where the couples walked and lighting the lamp near her window where Reggie Wiley used to turn his free wheel like she read in that book The Lamplighter by Miss Cummins, author of Mabel Vaughan and other tales. For Jerdy had her dreams that no one knew of. She loved to read poetry and when she got a keepsake from Bertha Supple of that lovely confession album with the coral pink cover to write her thoughts and she laid it in the drawer of her toiletable which, though it did not err on the side of luxury, was scrupulously neat and clean. It was there she kept her girlish treasure trove, the tortoiseshell combs, her child of Mary badge, the white rose scent, the eyebrowline, her alabaster pouncet box and the ribbons to change when her things came home from the wash and there were some beautiful thoughts written in it in violet ink that she bought in Healy's of Dame Street for she felt that she too could write poetry if she could only express herself like that poem that appealed to her so deeply that she had copied out of the newspaper she found one evening round the pot herbs. Art thou real, my ideal? It was called by Louis J. Walsh, Mag Arafelt, and after there was something about twilight, wilt thou ever? And oft times the beauty of poetry, so sad in its transient loveliness, had misted her eyes with silent tears for she felt that the years were slipping by for her, one by one, and but for that one shortcoming she knew she need fear no competition and that was an accident coming down Dalkey Hill and she always tried to conceal it. But it must end, she felt. If she saw that magic lure in his eyes there would be no holding back for her. Love laughs at locksmiths. She would make the great sacrifice. Her every effort would be to share his thoughts. Dearer than the whole world would she be to him and gild his days with happiness. There was the all-important question and she was dying to know was he a married man or a widower who had lost his wife or some tragedy like the nobleman with the foreign name from the land of song had to have her put into a madhouse, cruel only to be kind. But even if what then? Would it make a very great difference? From everything in the least indelicate her fine-bred nature instinctively recoiled. She loathed that sort of person, the fallen women off the accommodation walk beside the daughter that went with the soldiers and coarse men with no respect for a girl's honor, degrading the sex and being taken up to the police station. No, no, not that. They would be just good friends like a big brother and sister without all that other in spite of the conventions of society with a big S. Perhaps it was an old flame he was in mourning for from the days beyond recall. She thought she understood. She would try to understand him because men were so different. The old love was waiting waiting with little white hands stretched out, with blue appealing eyes. Heart of mine. She would follow, her dream of love, the dictates of her heart that told her he was her all in all, the only man in all the world for her for love was the master guide. Nothing else mattered. Come what might she would be wild, untrammeled, free. Canon O'Hanlon put the blessed sacrament back into the tabernacle and genuflected and the choir sang laudate dominum omnes gentes and then he locked the tabernacle door because the benediction was over and Father Conroy handed him his hat to put on and Crossgat Eddie asked wasn't she coming but Jackie Caffrey called out, oh, look, sissy. And they all looked was it sheet lightning but Tommy saw it too over the trees beside the church, blue and then green and purple. It's fireworks, sissy Caffrey said. And they all ran down the strand to see over the houses and the church, helter-skelter, Eddie with the pushcar with baby boardman in it and Sissy holding Tommy and Jackie by the hand so they wouldn't fall running. Come on, Jerdy, Sissy called. It's the bazaar fireworks. But Jerdy was adamant. She had no intention of being at their beck and call. If they could run like Rossi she could sit so she said she could see from where she was. The eyes that were fastened upon her set her pulses tingling. She looked at him a moment, meeting his glance, and a light broke in upon her. White-hot passion was in that face, passion silent as the grave, and it had made her his. At last they were left alone without the others to pry and pass remarks and she knew he could be trusted to the death, steadfast, a sterling man, a man of inflexible honor to his fingertips. His hands and face were working and a tremor went over her. 
She leaned back far to look up where the fireworks were and she caught her knee in her hand so as not to fall back looking up and there was no one to see only him and her when she revealed all her graceful beautifully shaped legs like that, supply soft and delicately rounded, and she seemed to hear the panting of his heart, his hoarse breathing, because she knew too about the passion of men like that, hot-blooded, because Bertha Supple told her once in dead secret and made her swear she'd never about the gentleman lodger that was staying with them out of the congested district's board that had pictures cut out of papers of those skirt dancers and high kickers and she said he used to do something not very nice that you could imagine sometimes in the bed. But this was altogether different from a thing like that because there was all the difference because she could almost feel him draw her face to his and the first quick hot touch of his handsome lips. Besides there was absolution so long as you didn't do the other thing before being married and there ought to be women priests that would understand without your telling out and Sissy Caffrey too sometimes had that dreamy kind of dreamy look in her eyes so that she too, my dear, and Winnie ripping him so mad about actors' photographs and besides it was on account of that other thing coming on the way it did. And Jackie Caffrey shouted to look, there was another and she leaned back and the garters were blue to match on account of the transparent and they all saw it and they all shouted to look, look, there it was and she leaned back ever so far to see the fireworks and something queer was flying through the air, a soft thing, to and fro, dark. And she saw a long Roman candle going up over the trees, up, up, and, in the tense hush, they were all breathless with excitement as it went higher and higher and she had to lean back more and more to look up after it, high, high, almost out of sight, and her face was suffused with a divine, an entrancing blush from straining back and he could see her other things too, Nainsook knickers, the fabric that caresses the skin, better than those other petty with, the green, four and eleven, on account of being white and she let him and she saw that he saw and then it went so high it went out of sight a moment and she was trembling in every limb from being bent so far back that he had a full view high up above her knee where no one ever not even on the swing or waiting and she wasn't ashamed and he wasn't either to look in that immodest way like that because he couldn't resist the sight of the wondrous revealment half offered like those skirt dancers behaving so immodest before gentlemen looking and he kept on looking, looking. She would fain have cried to him chokingly, held out her snowy slender arms to him to come, to feel his lips laid on her white brow, the cry of a young girl's love, a little strangled cry, wrung from her, that cry that has rung through the ages. And then a rocket sprang and bang shot blind blank and oh. Then the Roman candle burst and it was like a sigh of oh. And everyone cried oh. Oh. In raptures and it gushed out of it a stream of rain gold hair threads and they shed an ah. They were all greeny dewy stars falling with golden, oh so lovely, oh, soft, sweet, soft. Then all melted away duly in the grey air, all was silent. Ah! She glanced at him as she bent forward quickly, a pathetic little glance of piteous protest, of shy reproach under which he coloured like a girl. He was leaning back against the rock behind. Leopold Bloom, for it is he, stands silent, with bowed head before those young guileless eyes. What a brute he had been! At it again? A fair unsullied soul had called to him and, wretch that he was, how had he answered? An utter cat he had been. He of all men. But there was an infinite store of mercy in those eyes, for him too a word of pardon even though he had erred and sinned and wandered. Should a girl tell? No, a thousand times no. That was their secret, only theirs, alone in the hiding twilight and there was none to know or tell save the little bat that flew so softly through the evening to and fro and little bats don't tell. Sissy Caffrey whistled, imitating the boys in the football field to show what a great person she was, and then she cried, Jerty. Jerty. We're going. Come on. We can see from farther up. Jerty had an idea, one of love's little ruses. She slipped a hand into her kerchief pocket and took out the wadding and waved in reply of course without letting him and then slipped it back. Wonder if he's too far too. She rose. Was it goodbye? No. She had to go but they would meet again, there, and she would dream of that till then, tomorrow, of her dream of yester eve. She drew herself up to her full height. Their souls met in a last lingering glance and the eyes that reached her heart, full of a strange shining, hung enraptured on her sweet flower-like face. She half smiled at him wanly, a sweet forgiving smile, a smile that verged on tears, and then they parted. Slowly, without looking back she went down the uneven strand to Sissy, to Eddie to Jackie and Tommy Caffrey, to little baby Boardman. It was darker now and there were stones and bits of wood on the strand and slippy seaweed. She walked with a certain quiet dignity characteristic of her but with care and very slowly because because Jerdy McDowell was. Tight boots? No. She's lame. Oh. Mr. Bloom watched her as she limped away. Poor girl. That's why she's left on the shelf and the others did a sprint. Thought something was wrong by the cut of her jib. Jilted beauty. A defect is ten times worse in a woman but makes them polite. 
Glad I didn't know it when she was on show. Hot little devil all the same. I wouldn't mind. Curiosity like a nun or a negress or a girl with glasses. That squinty one is delicate. Near her monthlies, I expect, makes them feel ticklish. I have such a bad headache today. Where did I put the letter? Yes, all right. All kinds of crazy longings. Licking pennies. Girl in Tranquila convent that nun told me like to smell rock oil. Virgins go mad in the end I suppose. Sister? How many women in Dublin have it today? Martha, she. Something in the air. That's the moon. But then why don't all women menstruate at the same time with the same moon, I mean? Depends on the time they were born I suppose. Or all start scratch then get out of step. Sometimes Molly and Millie together. Anyhow I got the best of that. Damn glad I didn't do it in the bath this morning over her silly I will punish you letter. Made up for that tram driver this morning. That gouger McCoy stopping me to say nothing. And his wife engagement in the country valise, voice like a pickaxe. Thankful for small mercies. Cheap too. Yours for the asking. Because they want it themselves. Their natural craving. Shoals of them every evening poured out of offices. Reserve better. Don't want it they throw it at you. Catch em alive. Oh pity they can't see themselves. A dream of well-filled hose. Where was that? Ah, yes. Mutoscope pictures in Capel Street, for men only. Peeping Tom. Willie's hat and what the girls did with it. Do they snapshot those girls or is it all a fake? Lingerie does it. Felt for the curves inside her days abile. Excites them also when they're. I'm all clean come and dirty me. And they like dressing one another for the sacrifice. Millie delighted with Molly's new blouse. At first. Put them all on to take them all off. Molly. Why I bought her the violet garters. Us too, the tie he wore, his lovely socks and turned up trousers. He wore a pair of gaiters the night that first we met. His lovely shirt was shining beneath his what? Of jet. Say a woman loses a charm with every pin she takes out. Pinned together. Oh, Mary lost the pin of her. Dressed up to the nines for somebody fashion part of their charm. Just changes when you're on the track of the secret. Except the East, Mary, Martha, now as then. No reasonable offer refused. She wasn't in a hurry either. Always off to a fellow when they are. They never forget an appointment. Out on spec probably. They believe in chance because like themselves. And the others inclined to give her an odd dig. Girlfriends at school, arms round each other's necks or with ten fingers locked kissing and whispering secrets about nothing in the convent garden. Nuns with whitewashed faces, cool quaffs and their rosaries going up and down, vindictive too for what they can't get. Barbed wire. Be sure now and write to me. And I'll write to you. Now won't you? Molly and Josie Powell. Till Mr. Wright comes along, then meet once in a blue moon. Tableau. Oh, look who it is for the love of God. How are you at all? What have you been doing with yourself? Kiss and delighted too kiss, to see you. Picking holes in each other's appearance. You're looking splendid. Sister souls. Showing their teeth at one another. How many have you left? Wouldn't lend each other a pinch of salt. Ah. Devils they are when that's coming on them. Dark devilish appearance. Molly often told me feel things a ton weight. Scratch the sole of my foot. Oh that way. Oh, that's exquisite. Feel it myself too. Good to rest once in a way. Wonder if it's bad to go with them then. Safe in one way. Turns milk, makes fiddle string snap. Something about withering plants I read in a garden. Besides they say if the flower withers she wears she's a flirt. All are. Dare say she felt I. When you feel like that you often meet what you feel. Liked me or what? Dress they look at. Always know a fellow courting, collars and cuffs. Well cocks and lions do the same and stags. Same time might prefer a tie undone or something. Trousers? Suppose I when I was? No. Gently does it. Dislike rough and tumble. Kiss in the dark and never tell. Saw something in me. Wonder what. Sooner have me as I am than some poet chap with bear grease plastery hair, love lock over his dexter optic. To aid gentlemen in literary. Ought to attend to my appearance my age. Didn't let her see me in profile. Still, you never know. Pretty girls and ugly men marrying. Beauty and the beast. Besides I can't be so if Molly. Took off her hat to show her hair. Wide brim. Bought to hide her face, meeting someone might know her, bend down or carry a bunch of flowers to smell. 
Hair strong and rut. 10 bob I got for Molly's combings when we were on the rocks in Hall Street. Why not? Suppose he gave her money. Why not? All a prejudice. She's worth 10, 15, more, a pound. What? I think so. All that for nothing. Bold hand, Mrs. Marion. Did I forget to write address on that letter like the postcard I sent to Flynn? And the day I went to Drimmy's without a necktie. Wrangle with Molly it was put me off. No, I remember. Richie Goulding, he's another. Weighs on his mind. Funny my watch stopped at half past four. Dust. Shark liver oil they used to clean. Could do it myself. Save. Was that just when he, she? Oh, he did. Into her. She did. Done. Ah. Mr. Bloom with careful hand recomposed his wet shirt. Oh lord, that little limping devil. Begins to feel cold and clammy. After effect not pleasant. Still you have to get rid of it some way. They don't care. Complimented perhaps. Go home to nicey bread and milky and say night prayers with the kitties. Well, aren't they? See her as she is spoil all. Must have the stage setting, the rouge, costume, position, music. The name too. Amours of actresses. Nell Gwynn, Mrs. Bracegirdle, Maud Branscombe. Curtain up. Moonlight silver effulgence. Maiden discovered with pensive bosom. Little sweetheart come and kiss me. Still, I feel. The strength it gives a man. That's the secret of it. Good job I let off there behind the wall coming out of Dignam's. Cider that was. Otherwise I couldn't have. Makes you want to sing after. La Causis and Teratara. Suppose I spoke to her. What about? Bad plan however if you don't know how to end the conversation. Ask them a question they ask you another. Good idea if you're stuck. Gain time. But then you're in a cart. Wonderful of course if you say, good evening, and you see she's on for it, good evening. Oh but the dark evening in the Appian way I nearly spoke to Mrs. Clincho thinking she was. Phew. Girl in Meath Street that night. All the dirty things I made her say. All wrong of course. My arc she called it. It's so hard to find one who. Aho. Uh-huh. If you don't answer when they solicit must be horrible for them till they harden. And kissed my hand when I gave her the extra two shillings. Parrots. Press the button and the bird will squeak. Wish she hadn't called me sir. Oh, her mouth in the dark. And you a married man with a single girl. That's what they enjoy. Taking a man from another woman. Or even hear of it. Different with me. Glad to get away from other chap's wife. Eating off his cold plate. Chap in the Burton today spitting back gum chewed gristle. French letter still in my pocketbook. Cause of half the trouble. But might happen sometime, I don't think. Come in, all is prepared. I dreamt. What? Worst is beginning. How they change the venue when it's not what they like. Ask you do you like mushrooms because she once knew a gentleman who. Or ask you what someone was going to say when he changed his mind and stopped. Yet if I went the whole hog, say, I want to, something like that. Because I did. She too. Offend her. Then make it up. Pretend to want something awfully, then cry off for her sake. Flatters them. She must have been thinking of someone else all the time. What harm? Must since she came to the use of reason, he, he and he. First kiss does the trick. The propitious moment. Something inside them goes pop. Mushy like, tell by their eye, on the sly. First thoughts are best. Remember that till their dying day. Molly, Lieutenant Mulvey that kissed her under the Moorish wall beside the gardens. Fifteen she told me. But her breasts were developed. Fell asleep then. After Glen Cree dinner that was when we drove home. Featherbed Mountain. Gnashing her teeth in sleep. Lord Mayor had his eye on her too. Val Dillon. Apoplectic. There she is with them down there for the fireworks. My fireworks. Up like a rocket, down like a stick. And the children, twins they must be, waiting for something to happen. Want to be grown-ups. Dressing in mother's clothes. Time enough, understand all the ways of the world. And the dark one with the mop head and the nigger mouth. I knew she could whistle. Mouth made for that. Like Molly. Why that high-class whore in jammets wore her veil only to her nose. Would you mind, please, telling me the right time? I'll tell you the right time up a dark lane. Say prunes and prisms forty times every morning, cure for fat lips. Caressing the little boy too. Onlookers see most of the game. Of course they understand birds, animals, babies. 
in their line. Didn't look back when she was going down the strand. Wouldn't give that satisfaction. Those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls. Fine eyes she had, clear. It's the white of the eye brings that out not so much the pupil. Did she know what I? Course. Like a cat sitting beyond a dog's jump. Women never meet one like that Wilkins in the high school drawing a picture of Venus with all his belongings on show. Call that innocence? Poor idiot. His wife has her work cut out for her. Never see them sit on a bench marked wet paint. Eyes all over them. Look under the bed for what's not there. Longing to get the fright of their lives. Sharp as needles they are. When I said to Molly the man at the corner of Cuff Street was good looking, thought she might like, twigged it once he had a false arm. Had, too. Where do they get that? Typist going up Roger Green stares two at a time to show her understandings. Handed down from father to, mother to daughter, I mean. Bread in the bone. Millie for example drying her handkerchief on the mirror to save the ironing. Best place for an ad to catch a woman's eye on a mirror. And when I sent her for Molly's paisley shawl to Prescott's by the way that ad I must, carrying home the change in her stocking. Clever little minx. I never told her. Neat way she carries parcels too. Attract men, small thing like that. Holding up her hand, shaking it, to let the blood flow back when it was red. Who did you learn that from? Nobody. Something the nurse taught me. Oh, don't they know. Three years old she was in front of Molly's dressing table, just before we left Lombard Street West. Me have a nice pace. Mullingar. Who knows? Ways of the world. Young student. Straight on her pins anyway not like the other. Still she was game. Lord, I am wet. Devil you are. Swell of her calf. Transparent stockings, stretched to breaking point. Not like that front today. A, E rumpled stockings. Or the one in Grafton Street. White. Wow. Beef to the heel. A monkey puzzle rocket burst, spluttering and darting crackles. Zrids and zrids, zrids, zrids and Sissy and Tommy and Jackie ran out to see an Eddie after with the pushcar and then jerty beyond the curve of the rocks. Will she? Watch. Watch. See. Look round. She smelt an onion. Darling, I saw, you're. I saw all. Lord. Did me good all the same. Off color after Kiernan's, Dignam's. For this relief much, thanks. In Hamlet, that is. Lord. It was all things combined. Excitement. When she leaned back, felt an ache at the butt of my tongue. Your head it simply swirls. He's right. Might have made a worse fool of myself however. Instead of talking about nothing. Then I will tell you all. Still it was a kind of language between us. It couldn't be? No, Jerdy they called her. Might be false name however like my name and the address Dolphins Barna Blind. Her maiden name was Jemina Brown and she lived with her mother in Irish Town. Place made me think of that I suppose all tarred with the same brush. Wiping pens in their stockings. But the ball rolled down to her as if it understood. Every bullet has its billet. Course I never could throw anything straight at school. Crooked as a ram's horn. Sad however because it lasts only a few years till they settle down to pot walloping and papa's pants will soon fit Willie and Fuller's earth for the baby when they hold him out to do ah ah. No soft job. Saves them. Keeps them out of harm's way. Nature. Washing child washing corpse. Dignum. Children's hands always round them. Coconut skulls, monkeys, not even closed at first, sour milk in their swaddles and tainted curds. Oughtn't to have given that child an empty teat to suck. Fill it up with wind. Mrs. Beaufoy, Purefoy. Must call to the hospital. Wonder is Nurse Callan there still. She used to look over some nights when Molly was in the coffee palace. That young Dr. O'Hare I noticed her brushing his coat. And Mrs. Breen and Mrs. Dignam once like that too, marriageable. Worst of all at night Mrs. Duggan told me in the city arms. Husband rolling and drunk, stink of pub off him like a polecat. Have that in your nose in the dark, whiff of stale booze. Then ask in the morning, was I drunk last night? Bad policy however to fault the husband. Chickens come home to roost. They stick by one another like glue. Maybe the women's fault also. That's where Molly can knock spots off them. It's the blood of the South. Moorish. Also the form, the figure. Hands felt for the opulent. Just compare for instance those others. Wife locked up at home, skeleton in the cupboard. Allow me to introduce my. Then they trot you out some kind of a nondescript, wouldn't know what to call her. 
always see a fellow's weak point in his wife. Still there's destiny in it, falling in love. Have their own secrets between them. Chaps that would go to the dogs if some woman didn't take them in hand. Then little chits of girls, height of a shilling in coppers, with little hubbies. As God made them he matched them. Sometimes children turn out well enough. Twice not makes one. Or old rich chap of seventy and blushing bride. Marry in May and repent in December. This wet is very unpleasant. Stuck. Well the foreskin is not back. Better detach. Ow. Other hand a six-footer with a wifey up to his watch pocket. Long and the short of it. Big he and little she. Very strange about my watch. Wrist watches are always going wrong. Wonder is there any magnetic influence between the person because that was about the time he. Yes, I suppose, at once. Cats away, the mice will play. I remember looking in Pill Lane. Also that now is magnetism. Back of everything magnetism. Earth for instance pulling this and being pulled. That causes movement. And time, well that's the time the movement takes. Then if one thing stopped the whole geshabo would stop bit by bit. Because it's all arranged. Magnetic needle tells you what's going on in the sun, the stars. Little piece of steel iron. When you hold out the fork. Come. Come. Tip. Woman and man that is. Fork and steel. Molly, he. Dress up and look and suggest and let you see and see more and defy you if you're a man to see that end, like a sneeze coming, legs, look, look in if you have any guts in you. Tip. Have to let fly. Wonder how is she feeling in that region. Shame all put on before third person. More put out about a hole in her stocking. Molly, her underjaw stuck out, head back, about the farmer in the riding boots and spurs at the horse show. And when the painters were in Lombard Street West. Fine voice that fellow had. How Giuliani began. Smell that I did. Like flowers. It was too. Violets. Came from the turpentine probably in the paint. Make their own use of everything. Same time doing it scraped her slipper on the floor so they wouldn't hear. But lots of them can't kick the beam, I think. Keep that thing up for hours. Kind of a general all round over me and half down my back. Wait. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. That's her perfume. Why she waved her hand. I leave you this to think of me when I'm far away on the pillow. What is it? Heliotrope? No. Hyacinth? Hmm. Roses, I think. She'd like scent of that kind. Sweet and cheap, soon sour. Why Molly likes a Poppinax. Suits her, with a little jessamine mixed. Her high notes and her low notes. At the dance night she met him, dance of the hours. He brought it out. She was wearing her black and it had the perfume of the time before. Good conductor, is it? Or bad? Light too. Suppose there's some connection. For instance if you go into a cellar where it's dark. Mysterious thing too. Why did I smell it only now? Took its time in coming like herself, slow but sure. Suppose it's ever so many millions of tiny grains blown across. Yes, it is. Because those spice islands, Sinhalese this morning, smell them leagues off. Tell you what it is. It's like a fine fine veil or web they have all over the skin, fine like what do you call it gossamer, and they're always spinning it out of them, fine as anything, like rainbow colors without knowing it. Clings to everything she takes off. Vamp of her stockings. Warm shoe. Stays. Drawers, little kick, taking them off. Bye bye till next time. Also the cat likes to sniff in her shift on the bed. Know her smell in a thousand. Bath water too. Reminds me of strawberries and cream. Wonder where it is really. There or the armpits or under the neck. Because you get it out of all holes and corners. Hyacinth perfume made of oil of ether or something. Muskrat. Bag under their tails. One grain pour off odor for years. Dogs at each other behind. Good evening. Evening. How do you sniff? Hmm. Hmm. Very well, thank you. Animals go by that. Yes now, look at it that way. We're the same. Some women, instance, warn you off when they have their period. Come near. Then get a hogo you could hang your hat on. Like what? Potted herrings gone stale or. Boof. Please keep off the grass. Perhaps they get a man smell off us. What though? Siguri gloves Long John had on his desk the other day. Breath? What you eat and drink gives that. No. Man smell, I mean. Must be connected with that because priests that are supposed to be are different. Women buzz round it like flies round treacle. 
railed off the altar get onto it at any cost. The tree of forbidden priest. Oh, Father, will you? Let me be the first too. That diffuses itself all through the body, permeates. Source of life. And it's extremely curious the smell. Celery sauce. Let me. Mr. Bloom inserted his nose. Hmm. Into the. Hmm. Opening of his waistcoat. Almonds or. No. Lemons it is. Ah no, that's the soap. Oh by the by that lotion. I knew there was something on my mind. Never went back and the soap not paid. Dislike carrying bottles like that hag this morning. Heinz might have paid me that three shillings. I could mention Mars just to remind him. Still if he works that paragraph. Two and nine. Bad opinion of me he'll have. Call tomorrow. How much do I owe you? Three and nine? Two and nine, sir. Ah. Might stop him giving credit another time. Lose your customers that way. Pubs do. Fellows run up a bill on the slate and then slinking around the back streets into somewhere else. Here's this nobleman passed before. Blown in from the bay. Just went as far as turn back. Always at home at dinner time. Looks mangled out, had a good tuck in. Enjoying nature now. Grace after meals. After supper walk a mile. Sure he has a small bank balance somewhere, government sit. Walk after him now make him awkward like those newsboys me today. Still you learn something. See ourselves as others see us. So long as women don't mock what matter? That's the way to find out. Ask yourself who is he now? The Mystery Man on the Beach, prize titbit story by Mr. Leopold Bloom. Payment at the rate of one guinea per column. And that fellow today at the graveside in the brown Macintosh. Corns on his kismet however. Healthy perhaps absorb all the. Whistle brings rain they say. Must be some somewhere. Salt in the Ormond damp. The body feels the atmosphere. Old Betty's joints are on the rack. Mother Shipton's prophecy that is about ships around they fly in the twinkling. No. Signs of rain it is. The royal reader. And distant hills seem coming nigh. Hoth. Bailey light. Two, four, six, eight, nine. C. Has to change or they might think it a house. Wreckers. Grace darling. People afraid of the dark. Also glowworms, cyclists, lighting up time. Jules diamonds flash better. Women. Light is a kind of reassuring. Not going to hurt you. Better now of course than long ago. Country roads. Run you through the small guts for nothing. Still two types there are you bob against. Scowl or smile. Pardon. Not at all. Best time to spray plants too in the shade after the sun. Some light still. Red rays are longest. Roy G. Biv Vance taught us, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. A star I see. Venus? Can't tell yet. Two. When three it's night. Were those night clouds there all the time? Looks like a phantom ship. No. Wait. Trees are they? An optical illusion. Mirage. Land of the setting sun this. Home rule sun setting in the southeast. My native land, good night. Do falling. Bad for you, dear, to sit on that stone. Brings on white fluxions. Never have little baby then less he was big strong fight his way up through. Might get piles myself. Sticks too like a summer cold, sore on the mouth. Cut with grass or paper worst. Friction of the position. Like to be that rock she sat on. Oh sweet little, you don't know how nice you looked. I begin to like them at that age. Green apples. Grab it all that offer. Suppose it's the only time we cross legs, seated. Also the library today, those girl graduates. Happy chairs under them. But it's the evening influence. They feel all that. Open like flowers, know their hours, sunflowers, Jerusalem artichokes, in ballrooms, chandeliers, avenues under the lamps. Nightstock in Matt Dillon's garden where I kissed her shoulder. Wish I had a full-length oil painting of her then. June that was too I wooed. The year returns. History repeats itself. Ye crags and peaks I'm with you once again. Life, love, voyage round your own little world. And now? Sad about her lame of course but must be on your guard not to feel too much pity. They take advantage. All quiet on Hoth now. The distant hills seem. Where we? The rhododendrons. I am a fool perhaps. He gets the plums, and I the plumstones. Where I come in. All that old hill has seen. Names change, 
That's all. Lovers, yum yum. Tired I feel now. Will I get up? Oh wait. Drained all the manhood out of me, little wretch. She kissed me. Never again. My youth. Only once it comes. Or hers. Take the train there tomorrow. No. Returning not the same. Like kids your second visit to a house. The new I want. Nothing new under the sun. Care of P.O. Dolphin's Barn. Are you not happy in your? Naughty darling. At Dolphin's Barn charades in Luke Doyle's house. Matt Dillon and his bevy of daughters, Tiny, Attorney, Flowey, Mamie, Louie, Hetty. Molly too. 87 that was. Year before we. And the old major, partial to his drop of spirits. Curious she an only child, I an only child. So it returns. Think you're escaping and run into yourself. Longest way round is the shortest way home. And just when he and she. Circus horse walking in a ring. Rip Van Winkle we played. Rip, tear in Henny Doyle's overcoat. Van, Bredvin delivering. Winkle, cockles and periwinkles. Then I did Rip Van Winkle coming back. She leaned on the sideboard watching. Moorish eyes. Twenty years asleep in Sleepy Hollow. All changed. Forgotten. The young are old. His gun rusty from the dew. Bah! What is that flying about? Swallow? Bat probably. Thinks I'm a tree, so blind. Have birds no smell? Metempsychosis. They believed you could be changed into a tree from grief. Weeping willow. Bah! There he goes. Funny little beggar. Wonder where he lives. Belfry up there. Very likely. Hanging by his heels in the odor of sanctity. Bell scared him out, I suppose. Mass seems to be over. Could hear them all at it. Pray for us. And pray for us. And pray for us. Good idea the repetition. Same thing with ads. Buy from us. And buy from us. Yes, there's the light in the priest's house. Their frugal meal. Remember about the mistake in the valuation when I was in Tom's. 28 it is. Two houses they have. Gabriel Conroy's brother is curate. Bah. Again. Wonder why they come out at night like mice. They're a mixed breed. Birds are like hopping mice. What frightens them, light or noise? Better sit still. All instinct like the bird in Druth got water out of the end of a jar by throwing in pebbles. Like a little man in a cloak he is with tiny hands. Weenie bones. Almost see them shimmering, kind of a bluey white. Colors depend on the light you see. Stare the sun for example like the eagle then look at a shoe see a blotch blob yellowish. Wants to stamp his trademark on everything. Instance, that cat this morning on the staircase. Color of brown turf. Say you never see them with three colors. Not true. That half tabby white tortoise shell in the city arms with the letter M on her forehead. Body 50 different colors. Hoth a while ago amethyst. Glass flashing. That's how that wise man what's his name with a burning glass. Then the heather goes on fire. It can't be tourist matches. What? Perhaps the sticks dry rub together in the wind and light. Or broken bottles in the furs act as a burning glass in the sun. Archimedes. I have it. My memory's not so bad. Bah. Who knows what they're always flying for. Insects? That be last week got into the room playing with his shadow on the ceiling. Might be the one bit me, come back to see. Birds too. Never find out. Or what they say. Like our small talk. And says she and says he. Nerve they have to fly over the ocean and back. Lots must be killed in storms, telegraph wires. Dreadful life sailors have too. Big brutes of ocean-going steamers floundering along in the dark, lowing out like sea cows. Fa a balog. Out of that, bloody curse to you. Others in vessels, bit of a handkerchief sail, pitched about like snuff at a wake when the stormy winds do blow. Married too. Sometimes away for years at the ends of the earth somewhere. No ends really because it's round. Wife in every port they say. She has a good job if she minds it till Johnny comes marching home again. If ever he does. Smelling the tail end of ports. How can they like the sea? Yet they do. The anchor's weighed. Off he sails with a scapular or a medal on him for luck. Well. And the Tefalim know what's this they call it poor Papa's father had on his door to touch. That brought us out of the land of Egypt and into the house of bondage. Something in all those superstitions because when you go out never know what dangers. Hanging on to a plank or a stride of a beam for grim life, life belt round him, gulping salt water, 
and that's the last of his nibs till the sharks catch hold of him. Do fish ever get seasick? Then you have a beautiful calm without a cloud, smooth sea, placid, crew and cargo in smithereens, Davy Jones's locker, moon looking down so peaceful. Not my fault, old cockalorum. A last lonely candle wandered up the sky from Mira's Bazaar in search of funds for Mercer's hospital and broke, drooping, and shed a cluster of violet but one white stars. They floated, fell, they faded. The shepherd's hour, the hour of folding, hour of tryst. From house to house, giving his ever welcome double knock, went the nine o'clock postman, the glowworm's lamp at his belt gleaming here and there through the laurel hedges. And among the five young trees a hoisted linstock lit the lamp at Lee's terrace. By screens of lighted windows, by equal gardens a shrill voice went crying, wailing, evening telegraph, stop press edition. Result of the gold cup races. And from the door of Dignam's house a boy ran out and called. Twittering the bat flew here, flew there. Far out over the sands the coming surf crept, grey. Hoth settled for slumber, tired of long days, of yum-yum rhododendrons, he was old, and felt gladly the night breeze lift, ruffle his fell of ferns. He lay but opened a red eye unsleeping, deep and slowly breathing, slumberous but awake. And far on Kish Bank the anchored lightship twinkled, winked at Mr. Bloom. Life those chaps out there must have, stuck in the same spot. Irish lights board. Penance for their sins. Coast guards too. Rocket and breeches buoy and lifeboat. Day we went out for the pleasure cruise in the Aaron's King, throwing them the sack of old papers. Bears in the zoo. Filthy trip. Drunkards out to shake up their livers. Puking overboard to feed the herrings. Nausea. And the women, fear of God in their faces. Millie, no sign of funk. Her blue scarf loose, laughing. Don't know what death is at that age. And then their stomachs clean. But being lost they fear. When we hid behind the tree at Crumlin. I didn't want to. Mama. Mama. Babes in the wood. Frightening them with masks too. Throwing them up in the air to catch them. I'll murder you. Is it only half fun? Or children playing battle? Whole earnest. How can people aim guns at each other? Sometimes they go off. Poor kids. Only troubles wildfire and nettle rash. Calomel purge I got her for that. After getting better asleep with Molly. Very same teeth she has. What do they love? Another themselves? But the morning she chased her with the umbrella. Perhaps so as not to hurt. I felt her pulse. Ticking. Little hand it was, now big. Dearest Paply. All that the hand says when you touch. Love to count my waistcoat buttons. Her first stays I remember. Made me laugh to see. Little paps to begin with. Left one is more sensitive, I think. Mine too. Nearer the heart? Patting themselves out if fat is in fashion. Her growing pains at night, calling, wakening me. Frightened she was when her nature came on her first. Poor child. Strange moment for the mother too. Brings back her girlhood. Gibraltar. Looking from Buena Vista. O'Hara's Tower. The seabird screaming. Old Barbary ape that gobbled all his family. Sundown, gunfire for the men to cross the lines. Looking out over the sea she told me. Evening like this, but clear, no clouds. I always thought I'd marry a lord or a rich gentleman coming with a private yacht. Buenas noches, senorita. El hombre ama la muchacha hermosa. Why me? Because you were so foreign from the others. Better not stick here all night like a limpet. This weather makes you dull. Must be getting on for nine by the light. Go home. Too late for Leah, Lily of Killarney. No. Might be still up. Call to the hospital to see. Hope she's over. Long day I've had. Martha, the bath, funeral, house of keys, museum with those goddesses, Daedalus song. Then that baller in Barney Kiernan's. Got my own back there. Drunken ranters what I said about his god made him wince. Mistake to hit back. Or? No. Ought to go home and laugh at themselves. Always want to be swilling in company. Afraid to be alone like a child of two. Suppose he hit me. Look at it other way round. Not so bad then. Perhaps not to hurt he meant. Three cheers for Israel. Three cheers for the sister-in-law he hawked about, three fangs in her mouth. Same style of beauty. Particularly nice old party for a cup of tea. The sister of the wife of the wild man of Borneo has just come to town. Imagine that in the early morning at close range. Everyone to his taste as Morris said when he kissed the cow. But Dignam's put the boots on it. 
Houses of mourning so depressing because you never know. Anyhow she wants the money. Must call to those Scottish widows as I promised. Strange name. Takes it for granted we're going to pop off first. That widow on Monday was at outside Kramer's that looked at me. Buried the poor husband but progressing favorably on the premium. Her widow's might. Well? What do you expect her to do? Must wheedle her way along. Widower I hate to see. Looks so forlorn. Poor man O'Connor wife and five children poisoned by mussels here. The sewage. Hopeless. Some good matronly woman in a pork pie hat to mother him. Take him in tow, platter face and a large apron. Ladies grey flannelette bloomers, three shillings a pair, astonishing bargain. Plain and loved, loved forever, they say. Ugly, no woman thinks she is. Love, lie and be handsome for tomorrow we die. See him sometimes walking about trying to find out who played the trick. You. P. Up. Fate that is. He, not me. Also a shop often noticed. Curse seems to dog it. Dreamt last night? Wait. Something confused. She had red slippers on. Turkish. Wore the breeches. Suppose she does? Would I like her in pajamas? Damned hard to answer. Nanetti's gone. Mailboat. Near Hollahead by now. Must nail that out of Keyes's. Work Hines and Crawford. Petticoats for Molly. She has something to put in them. What's that? Might be money. Mr. Bloom stooped and turned over a piece of paper on the strand. He brought it near his eyes and peered. Letter? No. Can't read. Better go. Better. I'm tired to move. Page of an old copybook. All those holes and pebbles. Who could count them? Never know what you find. Bottle with story of a treasure in it, thrown from a wreck. Parcels post. Children always want to throw things in the sea. Trust? Bread cast on the waters. What's this? Bit of stick. Oh. Exhausted that female has me. Not so young now. Will she come here tomorrow? Wait for her somewhere forever. Must come back. Murderers do. Will I? Mr. Bloom with his stick gently vexed the thick sand at his foot. Write a message for her. Might remain. What? I some flatfoot tramp on it in the morning. Useless. Washed away. Tide comes here. Saw a pool near her foot. Bend, see my face there, dark mirror, breathe on it, stirs. All these rocks with lines and scars and letters. Oh, those transparent. Besides they don't know. What is the meaning of that other world? I called you naughty boy because I do not like. A.M. A. No room. Let it go. Mr. Bloom effaced the letters with his slow boot. Hopeless thing sand. Nothing grows in it. All fades. No fear of big vessels coming up here. Except Guinness's barges. Round the kitchen in 80 days. Done half by design. He flung his wooden pen away. The stick fell in silted sand, stuck. Now if you were trying to do that for a week on end you couldn't. Chance. We'll never meet again. But it was lovely. Goodbye, dear. Thanks. Made me feel so young. Short snooze now if I had. Must be near nine. Liverpool boat long gone. Not even the smoke. And she can do the other. Did too. And Belfast. I won't go. Race there, race back to Ennis. Let him. Just close my eyes a moment. Won't sleep, though. Half dream. It never comes the same. Bad again. No harm in him. Just a few. Oh sweetie all your little girl white up I saw a dirty brace girdle made me do love sticky we two naughty grace darling she am half past the bed met him pike hoses frillies for Raoul to perfume your wife black hair heave under him bone senorita young eyes mulvey plump bubs me bread van winkle red slipper she rusty sleep wander years of dreams return tail and agenda swoony lovey showed me her next year in drawers return next and her next her next. A bat flew. Here. There. Here. Far in the gray a bell chimed. Mr. Bloom with open mouth his left boot sanded sideways, leaned, breathed. Just for a few cuckoo cuckoo cuckoo. The clock on the mantelpiece in the priest's house cooed where Canon O'Hanlon and Father Conroy and the Reverend John Hughes S. J. were taking tea and soda bread and butter and fried mutton chops with catsup and talking about cuckoo cuckoo cuckoo. Because it was a little canary bird that came out of its little house to tell the time that Jerdy McDowell noticed the time she was there because she was as quick as anything about a thing like that, was Jerdy McDowell, 
and she noticed at once that that foreign gentleman that was sitting on the rocks looking was cuckoo cuckoo cuckoo.